I first met Mark last summer at a reception that a donor had um, given, and I was so impressed right away with Mark's depth of knowledge and years of experience and deep commitment to providing services to low-income and vulnerable community members. And so um, Mark and I had a, a long talk after that, and the Ritter Center provides so many services that I then sort of updated our helpline volunteers. So we're super excited to have Mark here. And I think Molly's gonna add a little depth to this introduction with more history. Okay, thank you so much, Lou. And yeah, Mark, I'll give a little, little intro if you don't mind, and then I'll pass it over to you. Um, so thank you everybody for joining. Um, most of you, have probably attended or know what our virtual learning tables are. But as a reminder, um, you know, in the series, we host local experts and we learn about a variety of different topics um, and services. So, you know, we encourage you to ask questions and, you know, learn more about these, these services available to you and to our community members. Um, so today we are so pleased to welcome Mark Shotwell. He's the CEO of the Ritter Center. And there's so much uh, so much to share about Mark, but I'll just share a little bit, um, which is that he brings over 30 years of experience to the Ritter Center, starting from, you know, I know I listed some of this in the in the invite, but starting from the behavioral healthcare movement at Benita House to creating the first and largest housing first program in Alameda County. Um, Mark's focus has been centered on individuals facing complex co-occurring conditions in their life, ranging from chronic diseases and substance abuse to mental health and or mental illness and homelessness. Um, so for the sake of time, I'll now pass it along to Mark, but just everybody give a warm welcome to Mark Shotwell. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Well, thank you, Molly, and thank you, Lou, very much for the introduction. And it's uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with all of you. And um, before I, so I have a PowerPoint presentation, and I promise it's mostly pictures. So I I will do my best not to bore you to death by reading slides. Um, I have a couple of slides at the end that have a, some statistics around homelessness that I thought would be important for us to talk about about what is here in Moran and, and what's happening. But I wanna start because I'm I'm with a NAMI group. So I wanna start in an important place uh, for me, which is why did I come to do this work in the first place? And so uh, I came to do this work first in, uh, in the first place because when I was a young uh, teen and a young adult, I went through some pretty significant challenges in my life with mental illness and co-occurring substance use. And I was very fortunate. Um, I did have a, I should leave. I wasn't fortunate initially. I had a lot of, a lot of challenges and my parents especially were very distressed about the things that I was going through. And unfortunately at the time that I was going through those things and my family was, nobody pointed my parents in the direction of NAMI. And I wish they had, because instead my parents got a book on schizophrenia and I won't tell you all about the book, but I will tell you it basically ended with your son's life is basically over now. He's going to be symptomatic for the rest of his life and best of luck. So that was devastating, right? I was a 21, 22 year old man. They're reading a book about something that they didn't know anything about and they weren't hearing hopeful things. And guess what? That wasn't the outcome at all um, because I was fortunate enough to meet people who had a much more hopeful outlook on recovery. Um, on what can happen when you have a support system, on what can happen when you get the right people in your life. And both my family and I got a lot of support. And later, as I decided what I wanted to do with my life, now that I got to have a life, um, I knew that I wanted to help people to be able to get on a good path in their life. I wanted to support family members who were going through some of these struggles that I wish somebody had been there for my parents at those times. Um, and as I got into this profession and learned about NAMI and learned about the family to family support and uh, and what happens, I uh, want you to know that I refer many people here in Marin County to you um, and have done that throughout my career because I consider this to be such an essential support uh, for people and really what can be life changing to be able to learn about how to navigate 
mental illness, to navigate supporting a loved one, to navigate systems that very honestly we all know sometimes are complicated and sometimes are not easy to navigate. And that just makes recovery all that more difficult for the family member and the and the person they're trying to support. So bless all of you for the work that you do. I get a little choked up thinking about it, but that's why I was so uh, so happy to meet Lou and so happy to make this connection. And, it, and that's why it's an honor for me to be able to be here and share a little bit about Ritter Center with you here today. Um, so I don't know if that's the normal introduction of a nonprofit executive, but there you go, right? Um, so uh, <clears throat> the other reason I tell that story is because I know at the beginning for a lot of people, one of the things that mental illness does is it changes the course of life. We kind of thought we were going in this direction. We had whatever thoughts we had about that. And all of a sudden it's like, well, so what, so what does this mean? And what is now my role as a parent? What is my role as a loved one in this person's life? What is, if I'm the person dealing with mental illness, what does this mean? And do I have to take medications to be okay? Am I going to be okay? Do the goals still happen? Do the relationships still happen? Do the life events that we had thought were going to happen, happen? Um, and as we all know, like the course is an individual course and an individual family course. It's not one way that those things play out. But I could easily pass in my life at this point as somebody who's just a nonprofit executive, and I could easily not share those things. Um, and I don't want to do that, right? Um, I want to be honest about my struggles. And I've had struggles throughout my life. I didn't have just struggles when I was young. Um, but fortunately, that support, st support system that I got established has helped me to weather those those challenges. And I sure wouldn't want to be counted out personally um, for when somebody saw me at my worst. Because at my worst, I'm not a nonprofit executive, I can tell you that. Um, I'm not coming before you to do a presentation like I'm doing today. And at my best, guess what? I'm a family man. I've got wonderful children, a wonderful wife. I got hobbies. I get to go surfing and do stuff like that that I really like. And I get to do work to be able to help other people. So my path is not everybody's path. That's just my path and, and my story. Um, but recovery is real. Um, and so I, I hope that um, I can be a part of bringing that hope to, to people who may not uh, know if there's uh, hope after and life after a diagnosis of a mental illness, because there sure is. But I'm preaching to the choir, so I will stop doing that. So, um, so I want to share the the PowerPoint that I have, which again, I'll, I'll talk about some things and it's mostly pictures. Um, I met some really wonderful people a few years ago that we started working with here at Ritter Center because when I came to Ritter Center, like many nonprofits that I've worked in, the staff here said, nobody knows what we do. <laughs> A lot of people are kind of confused about what we do. They're not sure who we help. And my question is the question I've always had, which is, well, who's telling them the stories? And we weren't at that time really telling the stories much at all. Um, and so I'm very proud to work with a team here that's helped me to not just be a person who says something like that and sounds kind of like a jerk, like, well, who's telling them the story? But instead, like, put put our money where our mouth is and start telling the stories. And um, the, the process of telling the story started with me meeting this wonderful woman, Kate Harrell, that looked at our website and she said, Mark, your website's like every other nonprofit's website. It talks all about what you do and there's not a picture of a human being that works at Ritter Center on your website. And you're a human organization and people need to know the humans that work there and the humans that you're helping and the humans that are on your board. And it was really profound, right? Because like I hadn't saw, seen our website in that way. And sure enough, after she said that, I went and looked on our website and there was lots of words and graphics and statistics and, you know. So that's why I want to show the pictures because I think the pictures like really help to be able to connect you to who we are because we're not a building and we're not a place. We're the people that, that work at Ritter Center. So, and we're the people that we help. So let me pull this up. Hopefully Mark can make all modern technology work. Can you guys see that? All right, we're off to a good start. And I think I can make it change. Maybe not. So maybe you're looking at it a little wonky, but ah, there we go. Okay. So I will, uh, so this is uh, our staff at Ritter Center. Um, so we have about 50 staff right now. And, um, we are located in downtown San Rafael, and I'll talk about our new site 
but we're still going to be located in downtown San Rafael, so I don't have to change my elevator script because that was a requirement. I was like, I can't say we live anywhere else, so let's just stay in San Rafael. Um, so uh, we have grown significantly over the last 10 years, so the staff is about double that they were um, uh, then, and I came to Ritter Center in 2018. So um, we are a health home. Um, and so part of what I think is important for everybody to know about Ritter Center is that many people do know about our work with people experiencing homelessness, but they don't always know that we work with lots of people who've never experienced homelessness. Uh, more than 50% of the people we serve have not experienced homelessness. Some of them are what we call kind of doubled up in housing or precariously housed, um, definite families that may uh, two or three families sharing a two bedroom apartment to be able to stretch their uh, incomes to be able to afford housing. So um, we provide all of our services regardless of ability to pay. Um, our primary uh, insurance that we bill is Medi-Cal. So that's the majority of people that we serve. And then we do have some uh, seniors that uh, have Medicare. And for the people that we serve, we're really their health homes. So this is primary medical care, urgent care. Um, you know, we work with people kind of over their life to manage the health issues. We're a small clinic. So we have two full-time family nurse practitioners that are our practitioners at the clinic. Um, and right now we don't do specialty care, but we have a very close relationship both with Marin Community Clinics and Marin Health. And so, for example, if somebody needed to see a cardiac specialist, we would refer them over to Marin Community Clinics, and then our providers work directly with the cardiac specialist there to ensure the best continuity of care. Um, and then after that specialist, then they come back to us. Um, we do drop-in and um, appointments. So often somebody, for the first time they come, they're trying to figure out what to do at Ritter Center. They may not already have an appointment, but they usually have something that they could use some help with. So we want to preserve drop-ins so that we can meet your needs the first day that you come, um, because usually you came for a reason, right? And we don't want you to have to like schedule an appointment and come back in four weeks and all that kind of stuff. Like, So we have the capacity to be able to see people uh, immediately. Um, and this is one of our uh, wonderful nurse practitioners. Um, uh, some of these pictures you're going to see, we're going to we're going to like update the presentation now that uh, COVID is changing, right? Um, but we were doing a lot of stuff where outside on the campus in the beginning of the pandemic, um, because trying to have as few people in the buildings as possible um, because of all the COVID things that we all know about. So uh, a lot of the slides you'll see here have us wearing masks because that's what a lot of us have been doing for a long time um, and having some meetings outside on our health campus. One of the new services that we launched over the last year and a half is our street medicine medical outreach team. And this is actually, uh, I'm realizing this is a, a slightly dated picture by about a month of our van. We've just rewrapped the van because we're now an expanded team. So we take a medical provider, a licensed therapist, a, a mental health provider, um, and then we have a collaboration um, now for this team with Community Action Marin and with SPAR. So we take a housing navigator uh, from Community Action Marin and a harm reduction navigator uh, to help with ensuring that people have access to Narcan to prevent overdose and uh, can work with people around safe sex education and those types of things. So we're a big group now and we can go out to anywhere in the world that people are at. So we take the van to um, some service sites like New Beginnings in Novato, which is a congregate shelter. And a lot of the people there don't have established care yet. And so we can bring medical care directly to them uh, as well as the therapy directly to them. And that often becomes a bridge for people to, first of all, get connected and get some of the things addressed that they need. Um, but to also change um, their experience that they've had, because unfortunately, if you've been homeless and you show up at a lot of places to get health services, you're not always welcomed. And sometimes you're not treated incredibly respectfully. So people are kind of shy about getting care or concerned that they're not going to be treated well. So this is an opportunity to change that narrative um, and to establish a relationship based on respect. Um, and based on them driving the care that they get. 
Um, and it's really great. Alec, who's our medical provider, he also works at the clinic. So after he gets a good relationship going, he can say, you know, you know, I work at the clinic, you can come down. And rather than coming to some place called Ritter Center that somebody hasn't been before, they're coming down to see Alec, who's that really nice guy I met out on the van who helped me with things. Um, we also go to encampments. We go out to uh, West Marin um, and set up shop uh, near Point Ray Station and also in Bolinas. Uh, Alec likes to talk about during the pandemic when they were doing vaccine parties out in Bolinas and stuff like that and uh, bringing that care to folks. So um, if there are locations that you know about where people are having difficulty getting to care and it would be good for us to go to them, please let us know about that and we can include that uh, on the schedule. So this is the most modern exam room that Ritter Center has right now as we got to build it in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and, you know, just looks like a van from the outside. I'd never been in a Ford Transit van until we built uh, the street van. And But we can fit four full-size adults, like standing up, walking around inside. It's uh, it's pretty amazing. And we can do any of the services, lab tests, and any procedures that we would do at the clinic, we can do out on the van. So it's... Uh, supposed to be really a bridge, right? We want to get people into care. And in the case of West Marin, we're not thinking that those people are going to establish, establish themselves as Ritter Center patients. There's a mountain between us and folks that are over there in, uh, in West Marin. So coastal health is probably going to be um, a better linkage for many of those folks. So we want to get get them established in care with us and then work to get them connected uh, to the clinic that's closest to them and it's going to work for them long term. This is our food pantry and about 350 families a week come and get several bags of groceries from us. This really extends the uh, limited income that many people have that, you know, hard choices sometimes between putting gas in the car that gets you to work or putting nutritious food on the table or what if something happens and I got to put new tires on the car? Where does that money come from? So this really helps to ensure that people have good food. Um, and they can use the money in their budget for other things. We have a, a long-term, very wonderful relationship with the Marin San Francisco uh, Food Bank. They're our major uh, donor, um, but in more recent years, extrafood.org is also a huge support to us. And um, our specialty, so this is a, a, a pretty big deal pantry, but our specialty is that in addition to giving food to people who have, housing, we want to have food that is also uh, not perishable and doesn't require cooking for people who may not have access to cooking facilities or refrigeration right now. And that's what we ask. We don't ask if you're housed or not when you come to the pantry. We just ask if you have access to cooking facilities and refrigeration. Because even for people who experience homelessness, sometimes they have a place to stay for a little while. And if that's the case, when they come to the pantry that day, we want to give them that kind of food. And if not, that's really where extrafood.org sometimes comes in really handy. Like a lot of those wraps and sandwiches that the stores are donating through extra food, they're still plenty good and wonderful. Who doesn't like a good wrap? Um, and those are things that for people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness that we can give to them and we know that they're going to get a good meal and be able to eat that right away. Our pantry has three staff, but we also have a lot of volunteers and we're building out volunteer opportunities for all of our services this year. Um, but we've had pantry volunteers for about 40 years now. Um, and um, uh, this pantry is a little bit small. The new pantry at the new site will be much larger. Um, yeah, so that's our pantry. Um, case management services at Ritter Center. We help people, I, I, this is the way I talk about it with staff, is that if you need help, you, all you should need to know is you need help and for what? And you shouldn't have to become an expert on the system to get the help that you need. That's our job, right? Let us be the experts on the system. Let us help you navigate the system. Just let us know what you need and we'll get you connected. There's really no thing as a one-stop shop. A lot of people like that terminology, like, I couldn't possibly do everything that everybody that we serve needs at Ritter Center. Um, we don't do legal services, for example, right? But Legal Aid of Marin does, and they're great. So we have a really good relationship with Legal Aid of Marin to be able to get people in to deal with those issues. So if we do it, then we can refer people to services that we provide. We try to do as much as possible there on the campus. We can help people get access to benefits like uh, general assistance. We can get people on the path by helping them apply for 
uh, social security or supplemental security benefits. We actually have some contracts through the county to navigate with people through that whole process. And we've been able to shorten the amount of time of people getting to approval with SSI and cut the time in half. Um, and a lot of that's just because we've got the right contacts, we can help navigate, and we can help providers that need to provide certain uh, information um, know what to provide so that they can get it right the first time. Most disability evaluators will say the longest lag is getting the right information from the providers and the too much going back and forth. Well, you didn't say this, you got to say this. So it's our expertise to help everybody to be able to shorten that timeline. Um, we also do representative payee services, and we're the only payee program in the county that doesn't charge the people who get the service from us. So if somebody's required to have a payee to manage their benefits, then we can do that uh, for people and we can do it for free. Um, and then we have a lot of rental assistance. So short term rental assistance for families or individuals who have a working history, but have some period of time for whatever reason that they can't pay their rent. So that could be that maybe they lost a job, maybe there was an illness and somebody was out of work and didn't have enough sick leave to, to have income coming in. So we can do security deposit and first month's rent. We could do several months of rent. Sometimes we even do up to 18 months of rent. Um, and we also provide supportive services during that time because you know, if a family is going through something like that, it's a stressful time. So if there are other things that we can help get uh, families connected to, and we're very proud that we helped hundreds of families with exactly this kind of assistance during the COVID pandemic, um, who were economically impacted, especially when everything was shut down. And almost all of those families had never experienced homelessness before, and we're happy to say still have not. Um, so they were able to get a few months of rent when things got going and they went back to work. Um, they were able to pick that up, and at the end of the eviction moratorium, they don't owe any money to their property manager, and they're on taking care of their life just like they were before all this stuff happened. That's by far the best way to end homelessness is avoid it altogether in the first place. Um, and I'm a huge, huge supporter of those kinds of prevention efforts because those families haven't experienced all the traumas of homelessness. It's hard enough to not know how you're going to cover rent and worry about your kids and worry about your family. Um, you don't need to experience the rest of it. Um, and there are other organizations that do this work too. But if you know anybody who's having those challenges, please let us know so that we can lean in and help. Um, we uh, do a lot of behavioral health services. So we have uh, three full-time therapists that work with us. Uh, Lucas goes out on the street medicine van three days a week, and he works at our campus two days a week. Augustina is full-time at our campus. And then as the pandemic started, you may all know this, but you know, prior to the COVID pandemic, Medi-Cal wouldn't pay for telehealth at all. So both in behavioral health and medical, it was never an option if Medi-Cal was your insurance until the pandemic. And that changed everything. And so it became a part of the public health emergency. For medical services, it is definitely destined to stay, which is great. And there's a lot of advocacy going on right now because the state thinks they're going to preserve telehealth for behavioral health. But right now, the sticking point is they're like, as long as it can be on video. And that's great if you have access to being able to do something on video. And I would agree that that's a better way to do it than just over the phone. But I think it's better to get behavioral health services over the phone than not at all. So um, that's the advocacy that's going on right now. Uh, Justin is our third therapist, and he does all telehealth visits. So we've seen quite an uptick uh, increase in people accessing behavioral health services since we've had telehealth as an option. And it's like people like the 74-year-old woman that talks to me and tells me, you know, Mark, it's been a game changer for me to have it. But if I had to come down to the campus and risk somebody seeing me walk into Ritter Center and asking me why I was there, I probably wouldn't do it because I don't want to talk about this. I want to talk about it with my therapist, but I don't want to talk about it with anybody else. 
So stigma is real um, and having those options as well as, you know, for some of the moms that we do it for that don't have to figure out how they're going to have their kids stay somewhere where they come down to a therapy session. Um, I don't know. I've got kids. I don't know how you put kids away so you can have a therapy session. If anybody knows how to do that, let me know and I'll try to figure that out myself. But they're able to do that much easier at home uh, where they can just access the, the therapy from home. We also have uh, an outpatient substance abuse program, um, and it's funded also through Medi-Cal. Um, and we really set a low bar. If you are interested in trying to figure out what it might look like to not use substances anymore, that's good enough for us. Um, so that's an educational process. We all know it takes time to learn information to make decisions. Um, and when somebody starts thinking about, I might want to at some point let go of this, that's a good opportunity to get connected with professionals that can help you to start thinking about that. Um, and so if somebody has a relapse along the way, whether that's a mental health relapse or a substance use relapse, these are illnesses that sometimes people have relapses. It's just the way that it is, right? You don't stop treating somebody because they have a symptom of the illness. That's bad medicine. Um, so we want to hang in there with people. So um, Fortunately, a lot of people are getting on a good path. Um, and one of the things that we're also really proud of is our medication assisted treatment around substance use to help give people options that can make it easier to stop substances. And then Narcan has become big business for us in helping people to prevent overdose. And the latest thing right now, you have to up until this happened, you had to come in and ask us for Narcan. And of course, we will train our patients to Narcan because those are the people who are most likely to be with somebody else when an overdose happens and can use Narcan and save that person's life. Um, but you had to ask us for it. So back to stigma, sometimes people don't want to ask us for it. So the county partnered with us and they got us a vending machine and we got it now up on the campus and you can come onto the campus and you can go to the vending machine and you don't have to pay any money to use this particular vending machine. It's the best vending machine in the world, it's free. Um, and you can come and you can just get the Narcan that you need. And we were like, well, oh, let's put a few other things in there. So we're putting socks in the vending machine and a few other things that people can just come get um, and they don't have to ask us for them. All right, sorry, here we go. Um, I mentioned benefits advocacy. Um, there's a, uh, I'm sure you all are aware that with the public health emergency ending for people who have uh, Medi-Cal, uh, Medicaid across the nation, what that means is that throughout the public health emergency, people were just automatically renewed for their Medi-Cal and they didn't have to submit the paperwork to recertify every year. And that has now ended. Um, and as a result of that, um, over the next several months, everybody who's on Medi-Cal is getting notification that they need to submit some paperwork to recertify themselves. And if they don't do that, they lose their Medi-Cal benefits. So Erica Fuyo is the woman here in a mask that's one of our staff, and her expertise is around benefits. So Erica is a very busy woman right now, reaching out to all of our patients and clients, ensuring that people know about that and encouraging them when you get that letter in the mail, just come in and see me. And we'll do this process together. We'll hold your hand through it so that no bad outcomes happen. But as you know, some people are really good with mail. Some people aren't great with mail. Some people can understand government letters. If you know any of them, let me know and I'll talk to them too. Um, government letters are not always written um, in the easiest ways to understand. So there's a lot of advocacy that we're going through to make sure to uh, you know, public information to get the word out. Um, but definitely, you know, even if somebody was to get caught off of their benefits, Eric can help them get restarted really quickly. And um, I promise we're getting close to the end of the slideshow and then we're going to open up for questions to all of you. Um, so uh, you may have heard, uh, and you may know a lot about this, um, but some people, they've heard the terminology housing first, but don't really know what it means. And so what Housing First is, um, there's an organization called Pathways to Housing from New York City, and a, uh, a doctor, Dr. Sam Saberis, who developed Housing First first at Pathways to Housing in New York. And what Sam and his colleagues had done is they'd created this, initially created this great outreach team and kind of like our street medicine van, they had medical staff and behavioral health staff. And they're like, we're going to take the care out to people on the streets in New York. And time and time again, when they met with people who were homeless, 
the people who were homeless said, that's great that you want to help me with my medical issues. And that's great that you want to help me with my mental health issues. But I can't really do all that stuff right now because I need a place to stay. If you can give me a place to stay, I could probably do all that. But like, you know, managing medication, man, I can't manage that right now out here. And Sam said, you know, I had medical staff. I had case managers. I had behavioral health staff. You know what I didn't have, Mark? I didn't have any housing to give anybody. And it just all of a sudden clicked. If we don't give people housing first, we can't get the rest of the stuff done to improve people's health. So that's not a rocket science thing, but it was this epiphany where it was like, we've got to have the housing as the first clinical intervention. And that's an important thing too, is that housing first is not a housing program. It's a clinical program with a housing component. It's just with the awareness that the first thing we do is get somebody housing and then we wrap a very intensive support team that includes the medical staff and the behavioral health staff and the case management staff around people to help them keep their housing and then start improving their health. And the relationship starts with, hi, nice to meet you. Would you like to get off the streets and get into housing? All the services are voluntary. And so what I always tell my staff in Housing First is, it's not about telling somebody that they have to participate in the program or they're obligated to have a weekly home visit or a monthly home visit. That kind of language is not a language about partnership. That's a language that is the language of we have the power and you have to do what we say. So that's not what Housing First is. Housing First is a partnership. And very honestly, if a client doesn't want to have a home visit with our team, I tell my team, well, you guys just have to figure out how to make yourselves irresistible. They don't want to meet with you because they don't know why they would meet with you. That's not their problem. That's your problem. You need to figure out what they might need that you could help them with. Because you know what? who people like to see? People who are helpful. So you haven't figured out what they want that you can help them with. So work on that, right? And it's a whatever it takes model. So who likes doing their dishes? Anybody like doing their dishes on this call? I don't like doing my dishes. My staff do dishes with people. My staff mop floors with people. They vacuum carpets with people. They play dominoes with people. They cook with people. They help people by putting them in their car and taking them to a medical appointment, right? Because that's a lot easier than riding the bus to the medical appointment. Make yourself irresistible. Um, and as one of our wonderful staff says, I don't just play dominoes with people. I play dominoes with intention. So if I'm playing dominoes with somebody, I'm developing a relationship because we're talking. And the experience is we're friends right? The experience is we're connected because we like one another. And through that relationship, we can do a lot. So Housing First now is a national and global best practice, evidence-based practice. There's been 30 randomized clinical trials on Housing First. The statistics are really dramatic. 85% of people who receive Housing First end their homelessness. And there's an 85% reduction in hospitalizations and an 85% reduction in incarceration. In Marin, we're doing even better than that. In Marin, we have a 95% housing retention, which means that when people get into housing, they keep their housing and it's effectively an end to their homelessness. So there's a statistic later, but I'll just say it now. Since 2017, Ritter Center, the other nonprofits, St. Vincent de Paul, Homeward Bound, and others that are working on this, in collaboration with Marin County, we've successfully ended homelessness for 593 of the most vulnerable people experiencing homelessness in Marin. And it's through this practice. So when people look at examples of other Bay Area cities or counties and they say like, why don't they, do they know what they're doing? It seems like homelessness is going up. Point them in the direction of housing first, point them in the direction of these things. And also just know that there are advocacy groups in the world right now, the Cicero Institute is one of them, who are very anti-housing first and very pro-institutionalization. And institutionalization at some point, somebody needing to be at a hospital to be safe from themselves, hurting themselves or somebody else, of course, right? But in the long term, somebody being locked up in a hospital, it's not a good long-term hopeful outcome. And what we need is we need more voluntary options that are resourced really well. This is not a cheap model. It costs about $25,000 a year to keep somebody in a Housing First program. And that's their housing subsidy and the services, right? The statistic in Marin County is that same person homeless costs Marin County $65,000 a year. So for everybody who we end homeless, is this an expensive model? Yes. But compared to what? 
compared to $60,000 a year forever and tragic, terrible outcomes and jails that have people with mental illness in them and hospitals that are full of people with mental illness in them and humans that are experiencing those challenges who say over and over again, I just need a shot, man. Help me get off the streets. Help me get inside somewhere. And I'm not naive enough to think that that's the only thing they're going to need, but I got a really, really experienced team to meet them on the other side and do whatever it takes to help people have good outcomes. So that's housing first, and we're pretty excited about it. And this is one of our folks getting his key, and uh, he's still housed, and he was happy then, and he's happy now. Um, so this is homelessness in Moran. Okay, now we're in the slides with the words, and we'll move through them quickly, I promise. Um, you can see in 2022, there's been a slight increase in homelessness over uh, 2017. What you see between 2017 and 2019 is you see a dramatic reduction. So prior to the COVID pandemic, everything that we were doing here in Marin was really making some progress on ending homelessness. Um, we saw an increase due to the pandemic, right? However, in Marin County, we kept that increase to a pretty small number over the previous years. And that's in comparison to some other places in the Bay Area, as well as across the state, who saw some pretty massive increases during the pandemic. It's still not good to have an increase. So this is overall homelessness. So there is subsections of homelessness. So when we talk about the people who are the most vulnerable, those are people who've been on the street the longest, and they also have co-occurring disabilities of some kind. Um, most people who are on the streets have medical issues that are significant to very serious um, and mental health issues that are serious. Um, and a good portion also have substance use. But the mythology about people who are homeless on the streets is everybody's on drugs. And I'll show you a statistic in a minute that really uh, lets us know that in Marin County, and it's also true other places, that's not really the case. So when we look at 1,121 people in 2022, that's not all those people that have chronic homelessness, which is the long-term homelessness and the disability. Some of the people in that number are people who are experiencing homelessness for the first time for a short period of time. Um, but on the night when we did the count, they were on the streets, and so they're counted. So housing first is the right intervention for people who are chronically homeless, long-term homelessness, and a disability. Not everybody needs housing first. So it's actually about 600 people out of the 1121 that need housing first that are still on the streets. And the rest, another intervention like I was talking about earlier, the short-term rental assistance, short-term supports, is usually gonna be the thing that will get people on track in their life. So that's also important. So if you think about it, we've housed 593 people through Housing First in the last five and a half years. And in this number is about 600 more people on the streets right now that need their homelessness ended. So we're at about the halfway point. We're not celebrating yet. We'll celebrate when we get every single one of those people inside and every other person on this list inside. Um, because we want to get to functional zero, where if you become homeless today, we've got housing to put you in tomorrow. That's the goal, so that nobody experiences long-term homelessness. So a lot of words here, not going to read all of them, but uh, if Molly and Lou want me to send you guys these slides and you can provide them for folks. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that I did say that I would point out, and it's the second to last bullet, is that um, only about 28% of the people who are homeless in Marin uh, have alcohol and drug use. Um, so that's one of those things where it's like, is it, is it a significant factor for those people? Yes. Um, but it's not the majority of people even that are on the streets. Um, you can see with uh, about 42% with psychiatric and emotional disorders, 35% with post-traumatic stress. Um, so those are just some statistics. Um, and, you know, we all can kind of relate. I remember uh, having a young man that we worked with, you know, and he talked about the medication that he had to take three times a day. And then the other medication they gave him that needed to be refrigerated when they discharged him from the hospital to homelessness. And it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It's like, well, he obviously doesn't have a refrigerator. So that medication is immediately no good for him. And he said, I usually did pretty good for a little while on the three times a day mark, but I don't have a watch. And I was trying to figure out what time it was and is it time to take the medication? And it doesn't take very long. That's not, not the priority on the streets anymore. So I mentioned what's working. Um, 
part of how we do things here, the second bullet around the by name list is that what's really important is to get to know every person who's on the streets by their name and their story, right? These are not statistics. These are not numbers. These are human beings. And what somebody needs to be able to get off the streets and get into housing is what they need. And somebody else might need something different. So we go through a lot of meetings. Um, and what I would describe is this level of collaboration with an entire system. It's a grind, right? People like me and my staff are in meetings multiple times a week talking about all of these individuals. But it's essential that we're there. It's essential that we're committed. And it's essential that all the nonprofits and the county government work like one agency. Um, because otherwise, people just bounce around our different agencies and our different programs, and it's uncoordinated. And who suffers? The people who suffer are the people who need us, right? So the fact that I got to go to extra meetings, uh, get over it, Mark. You got to go to some extra meetings so you can ensure to collaborate so the people who need your help get it when they need it. Um, and the way our system works right now is we are pri prioritizing and housing the most vulnerable first, right? So we are working through that list with basically, if you're going to die on the streets tonight, we're going to get to you first. And then we're just working through to get to everybody eventually. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the statistics around people staying housed and how many people we helped. Um, here, uh, in addition to the hospitalizations that I mentioned, we've also reduced just emergency medical service contacts by 54%. Um, for the San Rafael police, they've had an 85% reduction in contacts with homeless individuals as a result of these services. So this is how those savings start to happen, right? Because the police department isn't having to spend time sending their officers out to be able to go deal with people who are homeless, don't have a place to stay, but now they're sitting in somebody's doorway and somebody's like, they can't be there. So a cop has to show up to tell you to move on, right? I know some officers and I know why they got into police work and it sure wasn't to go hassle somebody who was homeless, right? Most of them wanted to like solve crimes and keep the community safe, but they end up having to do this kind of stuff. So homelessness is bad for a community, right? It's a tragedy for the people experiencing it, but let's be honest, like we don't want to see homelessness in downtown San Rafael. We don't want to see homelessness right outside of our house. We don't want to see it outside of our children's school. If we're compassionate, we understand, but it's still, it's not ideal, right? That's not where, I, you know, so let's get people inside. I remember when Mayor Phillips was here, I told Mayor Phillips, it's like, look, Mr. Mayor, we're not that far apart in our ideas. You don't want people to be homeless in downtown San Rafael and neither do I, right? So let's end homelessness for those people uh, and get San Rafael to be a business district for everybody rather than where everybody has to congregate. Since 593 people have gotten inside, downtown San Rafael sure feels different than it did a few years ago. So here's some of the, the challenges. Um, it's expensive to house people in Marin. Probably not a surprise to this group, right? Um, you know, it averages around $2,600 per month for each of these individuals, sometimes a little more than that. Um, Back in the early days of Housing First, when I was doing it in Alameda County, we were getting studios and one bedrooms in Alameda County for eight, nine hundred dollars. So money doesn't stretch as far to house as many people anymore. Um, we need more Housing First in Marin County. So that's, you know, we need more capacity. Um, the stock of housing in Marin overall is limited. Um, and so just having available units um, and what uh, the Marin Housing Authority did is they developed a couple positions called housing locators. And those are the people who go meet with property managers and get to know them and get property managers familiar with the idea of providing housing to people like this, um, but mostly to uh, familiarize them with the program and the services that they're going to get so that landlords, property owners know we're the team that's going to show up. You know, you don't have to be the mental health provider. You don't have to be the housing provider. That's us. All you got to do is rent a unit and we'll show up and be the single point of responsibility to address whatever happens in the housing. Um, the other thing in, in uh, Marin that concerns me deeply is how many seniors there are that are on fixed incomes while ho housing costs are not fixed. So there's an older adult committee now that is working on that, um, that I'm a part of, to be able to figure out some innovative solutions, home sharing, other types of things, um, so that seniors who have lived here their whole lives, this is their home, um, don't have to consider things like moving to a county that isn't Marin at a point in their life where they should be able to enjoy their home and enjoy their uh, later years, um, but without 
some way to address the fiscal challenges, people on a fixed income can really be priced out of housing at a very, very critical time in their life. So that's another thing that we all need to be uh, working on here. And Ritter Center is definitely um, trying to lead on creating some innovative solutions. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, I'm not going to do a long speech about it, but we're very excited that um, as of yesterday, we closed escrow on a building at 2nd and A Street in downtown San Rafael, and that's going to be the new home of Ritter Center in about a year from now. We've got a lot of renovations that we've got to do, and we're going to move all of our services there and all of our administrative teams, so stay tuned and come to our grand opening in a year and all that kind of stuff. All right, so I'll get this all off the screen now, so that's my little dog and pony show. I hope I didn't bore you with slides and stuff like that. So um, I'd love uh, to answer any of your questions or we can have discussions about things. We've got, got some time left, so. I just wanna thank you so much um, for sharing your story and your presentation was excellent. You did a great job. And I'm quite impressed with um, the Ritter House. It's, it's amazing, all the services that you offer. I'm wondering where do you get most of your funding? Sure. Um, so about half of our funding comes through Marin County Health and Human Services. So our budget is right about nine million now. So about five million actually of that funding comes through Marin County. Um, and that's everything from they help us with some money if you know, before people get Medi-Cal, we can't bill insurance if you don't have it yet. Um, some people may not qualify for it at all. So there's a small amount of money to help us with um, medical services. They help to fund the substance abuse program. A lot of the case management services that we do and the housing first programs that we do are funded through the county. Um, we also are a federally qualified health center. So in Marin, there are four federally qualified health centers, Marin Community Clinics, Ritter Center, Marin City Health and Wellness and Coastal Health that is now merged with uh, Petaluma Health. Um, so we get a large million dollar grant. Um, all health centers have the same $1 million grant. Doesn't matter how big you are or little you are. Um, and then the rest of your revenue comes in through billing Medi-Cal and things like that. Um, and then we have um, other state grants that help um, with some of the rental assistance. Marin Community Foundation has been a supporter for many years. Um, uh, and then we, through a lot of the communications we've started, we've been able to um, develop some relationships with individual donors who support the organization. And, you know, that's been one of the things that's been really profound to me is to, to meet a lot of people who deeply care about things that are happening with the people that we serve, want to help in a variety of ways. So some people come on our board and help advise us around different things. Other people have supported, you know, programs like our family to family program to to get gifts to families at the end of the year or help to support our services. So it's kind of a, as many nonprofits, it's a mix of all of those things. But thank and, you. Yeah. Thanks for your kind words, Marilyn. Yeah. Uh, Mark. Mark. Yes. Hi, Jack. And I see Deborah and Lisa too. We'll come to you in just a minute. <laughs> okay, Jack. My next, I guess so. Um, we get a few calls, well, quite a few calls from parents or other family members of uh, somebody who has been 5150 and 5250 mm -hmm. because of, uh, you know, because some and her, her mentally ill, sometimes mm -hmm. chronically, and the, they're about to be released, usually too early, mm -hmm. usually because. The, the, you know, our guess is that there's no bed or they want a free bed or for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Yeah. And they, their loved one cannot live with them at home. Sure. And so they call us and they say, where can my, where can my son go? Where can my daughter go? Mm -hmm. Is there some program that, uh, and, and sometimes that person is not terribly cooperative either, but right. can we send not only the ill person who sometimes won't go to the river house, mm -hmm. but can we send the parent to go talk to somebody at river house? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, like we don't run through Ritter center specifically. We don't run uh, emergency shelter mm -hmm. um, homeward bound. As many people know through both new beginnings and Jonathan's place runs the congregate shelter in the County, but we have a very established, good working relationship with them. 
And many times, as you're suggesting, Jack, you know, being able to talk with a family member, think through what are the different options, um, talk about not just services that we have, but, you know, again, it's our job to be experts on the whole system, right? So if we don't do it, like we know a lot about the system and can try to help navigate. And, you know, sometimes that's been a relationship that's gone on over months before their loved one becomes willing for whatever reason at that moment, something happens and now they're willing to try something different, right? But we've got an established relationship um, and at the point, you know, and I always offer, um, you know, whenever, like, you know, we can meet your loved one where they're at. Um, they don't necessarily have to come to us, right? So, you know, we met with people in their family's backyard or something like that, to, because that's, it feels like a safe place for them and we'll go chat with them there, right? Um, so yeah, definitely let us help in those cases. We want to be a support to you and a support to those families. And um, congregate shelter is not, it's not the ideal situation for everybody. Um, Homeward Bound runs some really good programs and has some really good staff, but it can be hard for some people to just live in that kind of housing around other people. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of great options in that emergency situation you're describing, right? It really is an important thing. But the good news about the shelters here in Marin is that they are housing focused shelters. So once you get in, as long as you're willing to work on a plan to get into housing, you don't have to come in and out. You can stay there until you get into a longer term placement. And that's a really important piece, because if you choose to, you can go to a home or bound shelter and that can be effectively the end to your homelessness because they'll stick with you and let you stay there while you're working on the plan for the next step. And if that takes three months or six months or a year, you've got a safe place to be with good food and the supports you need until um, until you get to the next step. Great. And if I could just add one more quick question, which you mentioned at the end about helping seniors. Mm -hmm. We're getting more and more calls from people who are very senior, you know, 80 and above. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this one lady I'm thinking of who's uh, been in her apartment for years and years and the building just got sold. Yeah. And the new landlords are a yeah. corporation and she's about she's going to get kicked out within the next six months and she's frantic, you know, where mm -hmm. where is she going to be able to go? Yes. Where can I and where could I refer, you know, would I refer her to Ritter or would I call Ritter or how would I handle the situation? You know, either. Um, and then, you know, like there's a variety of different paths in those situations. You know, sometimes there's short term rental assistance that can help somebody who, you know, the rent has increased. But, you know, if they're going to have the ability to eventually pay it. Right. Yeah. But if the reality is that they're not ever going to be able to afford the new rent, then we got to go down some other path. Right. right. Um, there's also the legal advocates, you know, because in the situation like you're describing, I mean, you know, there's fair housing things to consider. Um, and so both through the fair housing advocates here and legal aid in Marin, I mean, there's a variety of paths to consider. It's very honestly, Jack, it's kind of a heartbreaking discussion. A lot of times right now, we have a 74 year old woman that gets therapy I mentioned earlier, right? I didn't meet her because she called asking for therapy. I met her because she knows in five years, the extra savings that she saved runs out and she can't afford housing anymore because on social, the social security that she, and I don't, I don't have a solution yet. She's doing the right thing. She got five years. She's trying to, but yeah, that's what we need to establish this older adult committee. And that's another thing. If any of you are interested, it's a public committee. Um, and if you or anybody, you know, is interested in this older adult committee, let me know and I'll get you connected to the people because we've got to figure out better solutions. I'm glad we could offer her therapy for the stress, but we really got to get better solutions for the seniors therapy fine, but it's not housing. Um, so so I want to give Deborah and Lisa a chance and um, I, I'll make sure that you guys have my contact information so that, you know, um, please reach out. Thank you very much. Deborah. Hey, Thank you. Um, I've heard about Ritter Center for years and years and years and the extraordinary work you're doing, but I never personally have interacted uh, with you and you and I haven't met. Um, I'm Nami Bruins president and have been since 2017. Mm -hmm. So thank you for coming today. Thank you for the extraordinary work that you do. Um, there were a couple of things that you said really at the beginning that, that resonated with me. Um, the first is the importance of storytelling uh, and you know, sharing your story today, it, it not only moves all of us who are here, 
it gives us hope and it destigmatizes. So we've been trying to do more and more at NAMI Moran. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, which is people don't want to speak out because of the stigma, but you can bust the stigma if you speak out. Uh, and I think we've been doing a better job and listening to your story and how you presented it. It's really very inspiring. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's something we strive to do every day. The, the other thing is I was going to say is that um, my observation is a little bit more complicated than that one, um, which is what really resonated for me was the, the, the message of the potential for recovery and hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we struggle with that at NAMI Marin because we focus on the, the perspective of families. Mm -hmm. And it's so important that what's going on in the mental health field is really groundbreaking. And there are lots of reasons for hope. Mm -hmm. But also as family members, if you hear too much about the recovery and your child hasn't yet recovered, it can be mm -hmm. very discouraging. Yes. And so we've really been trying to work on the balance of how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and many people on the call already know about this, but we're in the middle of doing some workshops um, with a, a terrific expert um, in the UK uh, who has done a lot of research on psychosis and serious mental illness. Uh, and he's a firm believer in the power of, of recovery. And his message really is, you may have to change your definition of what recovery looks like. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. he's really helped us as family members learn how to, is communicating with your loved one. That's a step mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't mean that they have to go to Cambridge. Uh, you know, so it's, 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 a, it's a message that we really struggle with, mm -hmm. but there's so much room for hope um, by all means, talk to Lou about this resource. If your mental health professionals mm -hmm. are interested, he's a terrific speaker and they're mm -hmm. on our website. Um, but I'm just uh, kind of curious how you, how you deal with the message of hope, yeah. uh, in recovery, certainly both with the person with lived experience, but also the family members. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So important what you're saying, Deborah, and, you know, part of why I say like, th this was my path and this is what happened for me is because, I know that it's not the same for everybody, right? And uh, and also like this is an ep this is an episode and chapter in my life today, right? Um, and um, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think you know it you know it starts with um, knowing that recovery is possible. And I, I love I forget exactly how you said it, but you know what recovery is and what that path is, is different for different people, right? And um, with many of the people that we serve, right, you know, it's like many of like, you know, the family relationships have gotten so strained, right, and things are so difficult, like things like Jack was talking about, where it's like, I can't have you home, but oh my, and, you know, and then the pleading for please let me come home, you know, is like, oh, it's just so hard on everybody, right, you know, and so, you know, the the beginning to, you know, he, here's a path and he, here's, here's a, first of all, just a different way to understand what's going on with my loved one, because it just can be so scary initially, and, and some of the things that come out of the person who's mentally ill sometimes at the loved ones are so hurtful, right? And so being able to have perspective that that unfortunately is driven a lot sometimes by someone's symptoms or illness and, and don't, don't, you know, I, I said some horrible things at some point um, in my life uh, to people who love me very, very much um, and have had lots of opportunity for them to see other parts of me that don't think that. So um, I don't know what else to say about it now, except that I will contact Lou about that resource. It sounds amazing. And um, and I think it's just as you all are doing, right? Having the sophistication to know that I want to be with this family member for their journey of recovery. I want to be with their loved one for their journey of recovery. Um, and they don't, just because this is my path, it's not the right path for everybody. Um, you know, uh, sometimes I question why I want to be a CEO of a nonprofit, but um, we get to do a lot of amazing things and it's and it's really fun. And I consider myself very fortunate that certain things worked for me at a young age that um, changed, of course, right? Um, and that may or may not be the exact same outcome for somebody else. So yeah. I know that we're out of time, but I want to, if we can, just give a minute to Lisa and Oh, I'm I'm good. I'm all good. Thank you. This was wonderful. So appreciate you and the Ritter Center. Thank you. Well, thank you again for the opportunity. And, um, you know, I mean it when I say reach out and it's not going to go to a voicemail and then I don't get back to you. And in fact, I'll give Lou and Molly my cell phone because 
I'd prefer you call me there than on my office phone because I can get back to you quickly. Um, and, you know, let's keep the relationship going. I look forward to getting to know all of you and um, and supporting the people that you support, like, um, and you helping us support the people that we support. So we're all in this together. Thank you so yeah. much. Blessings to all of you for what you do. Right on. You too. Thank, Thank you, Mark. All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>